Good afternoon, everybody. Um, there may be some more stragglers I would imagine may make their way in, but I think we'll get started. Um, it is my huge pleasure to be um, chairing this session. So my name's uh, Jen Rogers, and I am uh, one of the vice presidents at the Royal Statistical Society. So I am the vice president for external affairs. Um, and yeah, I am absolutely delighted that we've got Anthony Rubin here to give our final um, keynote lecture. Um, so, um, Anthony, I got him to write me a little bio. Uh, he's got his first job in journalism in 1995 and worked for a succession of mostly now defunct business broadcasters uh, before landing up at the BBC in 2002 where he thought that even he probably couldn't bankrupt the BBC. Um, he worked in daily business programmes before switching to being an online business reporter and then had a spell at what was then called the specials team, but is now called visual journalism. And he won his first RSS journalism award in 2011. And he's actually won two um, RSS uh, excellence in journalism awards. Um, around that time, he started delivering training for BBC staff in data and data visualization, and then worked on the BBC's training course in statistics. In 2014, he managed to get funding for an experimental post as head of statistics to be an in-house source of support for BBC journalists struggling with numbers. And some of you may know that uh, his successor is uh, Robert Cuff, who uh, is an RSS, oh, I think, yeah, he still is an RSS um, stats ambassador. So he carried on that role until the 2015 general election, during which he helped create the BBC Reality Check brand, which he stuck with throughout the 2016 EU referendum and the 2017 general election, and this is now his full-time job. Uh, he lives in North London with his wife and three children, occasionally finding time to play cricket and very slow football. Uh, when he finally found a year without an election in 2018, he spent the time writing his first book, Statistical, 10 Easy Ways to Avoid Being Misled by Numbers. He says he's enorm enormously grateful to the society which has supported his work and welcomed him into our ranks uh, despite him being far from a statistician. It is my great pleasure to introduce Anthony Rubin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jen. I'm enormously flattered and a bit intimidated by being asked to give the last talk at the conference in this magnificent venue. Uh, that feeling grew after the young statisticians section tweeted how much they were looking forward to my thought-provoking talk. It might not be thought-provoking at all, it might be absolute dross, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Um, also, as it's nearly party conference season and we're in a big conference venue, I'm half expecting to be leading the communal singing at the end. I tell you what, if there aren't enough questions at the end, I'll sing Jerusalem, and if they're too difficult, I'll sing the red flag. Actually, there were suggestions that we should have a more appropriate song to end the RSS conference. Uh, Tamandra Harkness suggested, uh, you've got my number, why don't you use it, by the undertones. Uh, one of my American relatives on Facebook suggested, you do the math, by Brad Paisley, which the country hit, which I don't know the words to, so you don't need to worry about that one at all. Anyway, I would like to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak to you today. Uh, I love addressing statisticians because there are lines that get a laugh among statisticians that wouldn't in any other audience. Uh, with audiences of statisticians, I've managed to get laughs with the following punchlines. At 4 a.m., I realised that I'd excluded the service sector. I'm sure you all remember the day you applied your first GDP deflator. And the classic, the woman at the Treasury told me it was probably a rounding error. You probably had to be there. Anyway, I've written this book um, primarily for people who are a bit scared of numbers to help them avoid being misled. One reviewer said it was like a dispatch from a foreign correspondent who'd been sent into the world of statistics. I'm confident that everybody in this room is pretty comfortable with numbers, uh, unless there's anyone who was trying to get to the DUP conference and took the wrong turning. <laughs> so why am I here talking to you? Well, because while some of the blame goes to the involuntary users of statistics, some of it must also go to the people who produce them and the people who refer to them. I've generally avoided calling myself a data journalist. Uh, when the BBC found some funding for my experimental role five years ago, uh, it was suggested I should be called the data specialist or something like that. Uh, but instead, I decided I wanted to be head of statistics, uh, which was a title I borrowed from an excellent journalist at the FT, with his permission, I assure you. 
And the reason I wanted statistics in the title was that I was less interested in what the most numerate people in the corporation were doing than I was in what the least numerate were doing. It's disturbing how many people in newsrooms can't confidently work out a percentage. And that's the journalists. What about the audience? I keep getting emails from BBC Audience Research saying that an extraordinarily high proportion of our viewers wouldn't be confident explaining to a friend what inflation was. And we have to explain what, they, what it means every time we use the term. The Ipsos Mori Perils of Perception study suggests that people in this country have very little idea about levels of unemployment, growth, or immigration. While we may talk about the need for better education to improve numeracy, we also need to acknowledge that everyone has areas where they struggle. I have enormously, enormous difficulty remembering people's names and who they are. I once confused the chair of the House of Commons Public Accounts Select Committee with a senior manager from the ONS. My weakness in this area annoys my wife no end. If you've looked at an RSS membership booklet recently, you'll know what my wife looks like. We were at the Society for an event the other day and she, it was pointed out to her that she was in the membership booklet. She was the one with the pre-Raphaelite red hair photographed on her only previous visit. She was quite surprised. Anyway, she'll say something about somebody and I have no idea who she's talking about, even though I probably had lunch with them last week. Uh, she's extremely good at recognizing people and can remember the names of pretty much everyone she's ever met together with the names and interests of a range of their relatives. On the other hand, she has absolutely no sense of direction. She could get lost on the way to the bathroom in our house, and I assure you that our house is not big enough to make that understandable. I have an excellent sense of direction. It's really hard for me to understand how my wife can get lost a quarter of a mile from our home, just as it's hard for her to understand how I can fail to remember the names of people who we've spent considerable amounts of time with. I want to be clear this is not a marriage guidance session, but what we tried to do is to remember our strengths and weaknesses. I draw her little maps and don't say things like walk towards the cinema or go the same way we went last time. Uh, while she reminds me who people are by describing what we talked about or where we were, which are things I'm much better at remembering. When you leave the safe space of this conference and go and try to explain statistics to people who not be, may, may not be comfortable with them, imagine that they may be as bad with numbers as you are with whatever you're not good at. The review of my book in the mail said, Anthony Rubin is a journalist who, for reasons too complicated to go into here, was made the BBC's first head of statistics. He had some serious catching up to do, now he's helping the rest of us catch up too. So, I am numerate by journalistic standards, but that's not a very high bar. When I was studying A-level maths, I struggled with the pure maths part of the syllabus, but the statistics part was less of a problem. I was allowed to do a project analyzing the results in test matches between England and Australia going back to 1877, and I was in heaven. In fact, if anyone's interested, when I last looked, Australia were 387 for seven, but Smith's still in. My key skill that has got me through this process of catching up has been the ability to say when I don't understand something and not claim to understand things I don't. This means that explaining things to me can take a while, but I generally get there in the end. So I thought I'd start by running through some of the statistics that have come across my desk from often reputable sources in recent years that we could probably do without. I don't want to spend too much time on the truly bogus stuff. I've devoted half a chapter in my book to some of the more outlandish claims that come into my inbox, such as that 55% of women have bought a new outfit specifically to wear while watching television, like in this, specific, like in this uh, splendid stock image, uh, inspired by glamorous outfits they've seen on Strictly or The X Factor. I've said before that the RSS should have a special section for people who make up numbers, uh, in case it turns out they're having much more fun than the rest of us. Uh, I've looked at the list of the other speakers at this conference, and I suspect that I myself am here to make up the numbers, although I understand that's frowned upon. Uh, but for the purposes of today, I think I'll refer you to the most powerful question in journalism. Now, if any of you have heard me speak before, you'll know about the most powerful question. For the rest of you, I'll pause for a moment to build suspense. Can I get a drum roll? The most powerful question in journalism is, is this reasonably likely to be true? Um, I get an extraordinary amount of rubbish in my inbox every day, and I don't have time to check the methodology in full for each one. The reason this question is so powerful is that I can take what I know about the world and use figures and sources that I wouldn't consider publishing to establish whether I think a figure is in approximately the right sort of area. So I can tell you that the figure about new outfits for watching talent shows is not reasonably likely to be true. Similarly, when this headline 
came up in the Telegraph in 2010. You can have a think about whether you think it's reasonably likely that every household in Britain is paying £4,000 towards public sector pensions. And you don't need to know how many households there are. You don't even need to know what average earnings are precisely. You could take a guess or even think about you know, what you, owe, you yourself earn if you don't think you're an enormous outlier. And you'll probably work out that £4,000 is quite a big proportion of that. So even if you're spending, paying that much in tax, um, you would then wonder who's paying for the army or hospitals or schools or other things if £4,000 is being spent on public sector pensions. Um, and this is an important question to be able to ask because the people who are a bit scared of numbers may be worried because they think they have to be right to three decimal places. And the point of the most powerful question is that if you're not the one conducting the research, you're unlikely to get told off by your boss unless the answer turns out to be hugely wrong by a factor of 10, as indeed this one was. This was the update on the website later in the day. But the most powerful question is also handy as a last step when you've finished a piece of research on your own. I spoke to someone who'd gone to great lengths to estimate how many single-use plastic straws are used in the UK each year. His methodology seemed sensible, but his answer, 42 billion, implied that every person in the country uses an average of about 650 straws each year. That's almost two a day which is not reasonably likely to be true. So the most powerful question can be used even by proper statisticians. So the first thing we could do without is dodgy stats in emails. Uh, the next one is rolling quarters. I know this is a controversial view, but when, as is the case with the unemployment figures, you release a figure every month, but this month's figure is not comparable with last month's figure, it's only, it's only comparable with the one from three months ago, you can see how journalists, even relatively numerate journalists, might get confused. This was how we ended up with the situation in February 2014, when some respectable news organisations were reporting that unemployment had fallen to 7.2%, and some were saying that it had risen to 7.2%. It had actually fallen, even though the previous month's figure had been lower. It seems to me that this is unreasonably confusing. If you don't have good enough data to release a monthly figure, don't release a figure every month. Similarly, I wonder if having a rolling quarterly GDP figure every month is really helping the public's understanding of the state of the economy. Talking of the state of the economy, one of the great innovations of government in recent years has been the establishment of the Office for Budget Responsibility, an independent body that makes economic forecasts for the government. Its work is excellent, and while it's obviously not going to be right all the time because forecasting is essentially a mugs game, you can be confident that it will have gone about its work in a basically sensible fashion. Which makes you wonder why we still get occasional forecasts from the Treasury, especially at referendum times. In 2014, we got the forecast that Scottish independence would cost Scottish families £1,400 each. That's the uh, workings, if you're interested. And in the EU referendum, we had the uh, analysis that E leaving the EU would cost British households £4,300 per year. Actually, the analysis showed that GDP would be lower by £4,300 per household, but somewhere in between the uh, report and the press release, and indeed that poster, uh, there was some confusion between GDP per household and household income, which obviously isn't the same thing. Oops. Um, so I asked a statistician from the Treasury whether he thought it made people more suspicious of other numbers coming out of the department, and he said that the questionable forecasts came from the economists, not the statisticians. Now, I know there's a great tradition of economists blaming statisticians and vice versa, uh, but I also know that most of the audiences I speak to don't get that distinction. So perhaps now that the OBR has been such a success, the Treasury can stop doing forecasts altogether. Next on my hobby horse tour is up to, which is the widely used and generally misleading weasel phrase. So, Here's something you've probably seen on the high street, always up to 60% less. Now, it looks to me like that isn't a guarantee that any prices have been reduced at all. It's just a guarantee that they haven't been reduced by more than 60%. <laughs> and again, in this one from House of Fraser, I'll give to you, notice the, the point size here, up to is in about five point and the 30% is in about 80 point. I'll give to you up to 30% off selected lines which presumably means that non-selected lines are reduced by more than 
So everyone needs to go and look for the non-selected lines. Here's another one. This is a story from the Metro. Um, South Yorkshire police spent £7,000 on 280 cardboard cutouts of officers in an attempt to deter thieves, which is fantastic. Uh, the force's headcount has fallen by 11%, but it says that the cardboard officers have reduced crime by up to 50% in some areas. So presumably more than 50% in other areas. But I'd just love to see the methodology. I mean, how would you demonstrate the effectiveness of cardboard cut cutout officers? It's fantastic. And for the last word in meaninglessness, here's this story from BuzzFeed. As many as 300 managers at BBC News earn up to £77,000 or more, <laughs> according to a leaked document. So what we know is no more than 300 managers earn either less than £77,000 or more than £77,000. So perhaps not one to hold the front page for. Now, we know that this is the sort of thing that happens in the news and from retailers, but it gets into other areas too. So the Liberal Democrat manifesto in 2017 promised to protect up to a million acres of accessible green space, while the Conservatives promised to reduce up to recruit up to 10,000 mental health professionals. And I'm not sure either of those is a worthwhile promise to choose who to vote for. Um, so my last one on the things we can do without is nervous government press officers and statisticians. And I should say that the ONS has been a shining light in actually trying to help journalists understand their figures. I don't think I've ever had ONS statisticians trying to avoid answering my often dumb questions about their output. But the rest of the civil service has had fear put into it by successive governments and often try their hardest to avoid even the most pedestrian of questions. We really need to get across that there's a difference between asking reasonable questions about published statistics and asking for commentary or interpretation of the figures. Take the time a few years ago when I wanted some figures on UK trade with the EU. I went to the HMRC UK Trade Info website and there I found a chart showing the figures I needed. But the figures themselves were not there. So I called the number listed on the page and asked if I could have the figures. They said that was fine until they discovered I was a journalist, at which point they said I'd have to ask the press office. Now clearly this is a ridiculous situation. I wanted the numbers used to, to make a chart on their site and if I pretended not to be a journalist, which obviously I'd never do because it contravenes BBC editorial guidelines, I could have had them straight away. As it was, I had to go through the press office, which meant I missed my deadline. This particular page has now been improved and you can get the figures straight from it, but the nervousness remains. Another one, do you remember when there was all the fuss about Ed Miliband having two kitchens in the 2015 election? And it got me wondering how unusual it was to have two kitchens. And it turned out that that was a question asked as part of the English housing survey. Uh, how many kitchens do you have? I imagine there being somebody in a DCLG office, possibly in Whitehall, who spends his or her time recording how many kitchens people have. I wonder if they've spent years waiting for anybody to care about the answer to this question. <laughs> and finally, their big day came. And we phoned the DCLG press office and asked how many households had more than one kitchen. And they said they couldn't tell us. Now, to be fair, they later relented. And the answer is 146,000 in England, if you're interested. Um, but we weren't allowed to speak directly to the statistician involved. And there was considerable nervousness about giving us the figure at all. I fear this is going to get even worse if we have an early general election. And innocent statisticians are made to fear perda, which again should not prevent civil servants asking factual questions about published statistics. Time and money is going to collecting these figures. It seems strange to be reluctant to publicize them, but maybe that's why I'm a journalist and not a statistician. That and the skills issue, of course. So I've been wittering on for quite a while now. So to wake everybody up, I'd like to play a game with you that I usually play with younger, less well-qualified audiences. I'm involved with the BBC's Real News Project, part of which involves going to schools and talking about how to make sure that the things you share on social media are not made up. So what I have here is a selection of news stories, all of which appeared on the 1st of April, some of which are April Fools and some are actual news. So let's see how good you are at telling the difference. So we'll start with this one. A proposal to name a bin in the Students' Union after Nick Clegg has been rejected. So hands up for April Fool. You've all got to get involved here. We're not having any, uh, any sitting on the fence. Hands up for real news. Yep, very well done. That one's real. <laughs> University of Manchester, I believe. Let's try another one. 
This is uh, from Richard Branson. It's great when two Virgin companies work together to come up with a really great idea. Well done to everyone at Virgin Australia and Virgin Active for introducing the world's first in-flight spin class. Uh, so if you're in first class uh, on a Virgin plane, then you can have a spin class and go on an exercise bike in the plane. Hands up for real news. Hands up for April Fools. Oh, you're jolly good at this. Yep, it's an April Fool. Let's try another one. This was the story that uh, Prince Harry's stag weekend was going to be in the uh, Welsh countryside, uh, a, a stag weekend in a yurt featuring yoga and chakra alignment. I uh, can't remember which paper that is. I think it may be the mail. Anyway, hands up for real news. Hands up for April Fools. Jolly good. Roadhogs, watch out for hedgehogs crossing. Signs warning drivers to be aware of wildlife to appear across the UK in a bid to boost declining numbers. I think this was the all-party parliamentary group on hedgehogs. Um, so they were going to have beware of hedgehog signs all over the place. Hands up for real news. Hands up for April Fools. There we go, it's real. You are much better than the children at this. Okay. <laughs> and we couldn't do this without some, uh, without some of the Donald. So this was the announcement from Carabao Energy Drinks, which I understand the young people drink. They're going to uh, make a mandarin orange flavor inspired by the color of Donald Trump's skin. Uh, available in real Donald Trump orange. Hands up for real news. Hands up for April Fools. Yep, got it again. And finally, uh, masked protesters relieve live, release live rats in a Trump hotel room and put a mock Donald Trump in a locked cage filled with McDonald's wrappers. Hands up for real news. Hands up for April Fools. Oh, it's 50-50 there. Yeah, that one's real. They did clean up afterwards, though, so that's good. Anyway, all this brings us on to the issue of truth. And I was at a talk by Sir Andrew Dillnock the other day in which he encouraged everyone to fight harder in the cause of truth. And truth is at the heart of what's now my day job at Reality Check, which is the BBC's fact-checking brand. And we deal with a wide range of claims, and some of them just mess with your mind. Like when President Putin said that wind turbines were bad for worms. But he also said they were bad for birds. And you can't help feeling that if there are fewer birds around, then that's good for worms, especially the early ones. <laughs> but anyway, we could find no evidence whatsoever for the, for the claim. Then there was the time President Trump said that US national debt was about $20 trillion, but that that was okay because the market capitalization of US listed companies had risen by about $5 trillion. It's really hard to know what to do with a claim like that. If the government doesn't own the money in the stock market, so mentioning it alongside the national debt just makes no sense, and you sort of wonder what to put in the second line of the story. Sometimes it's pretty easy, like when the people who make Jaffa cakes started putting fewer Jaffa cakes in a box but they claimed that the price per cake had not increased. This was the release from their uh, PR people. Price has not, the, reg the recommended price hasn't increased. Of course, they don't set the price themselves. Now, we on the team used our extraordinary quantitative skills to take the old recommended price and divide it by 12, <laughs> and then take the new one and divide it by 10. And it turned out that um, the price had gone up. In fact, it had gone up by more than inflation. And it, we found it slightly surprising that, first of all, no one had noticed this, and, and secondly, that the press team who released this hadn't sort of checked first. But there we go, that was an, another nice easy one. Then there was Boris Johnson's claim during the EU referendum that as a result of EU regulations, UK retailers are not allowed to sell bananas in bunches of more than two or three. That time, the reality check team nipped down to Tesco and bought a bunch of five. <laughs> it was touch and go for a while. I used self-checkout, and it said that there was a problem with the transaction. And I'm sort of, I'm thinking there's a European commissioner hiding behind the cornflakes. But eventually the transaction went through. It turned out there was an unexpected item in the bagging area or something. So I went back to the office and wrote up the piece, suggesting that he might be confusing the rules for retailers with the rules governing wholesalers and pre-wholesalers of unripe bananas. There are rules for how they package the green bananas, which say that they aren't allowed to pack them in boxes in bunches of two or three. They have to be bunches of four or more or single bananas. 
So I wrote this piece saying that Mr. Johnson might have confused a rule saying wholesalers aren't allowed to pack bananas in bunches of two or three with one saying retailers are only allowed to sell them in bunches of two or three. And one of the readers got in touch and said, well, he's basically right, isn't he? <laughs> Where do you go with that? So anyway, those are the easy ones. Uh, then there are the tricky policy announcements. The government announced a month or so ago that it was going to build 10,000 new prison places in England and Wales by the mid-2020s, and that they were completely new places funded by new money. If that sounds like a familiar target, it's because Michael Gove and then Liz Truss announced plans in 2015 and 2017 for 10,000 places by 2020 and then by 2022. Uh, it was also in the 2017 Conservative Manifesto. So the government says that now only 3,500 of those 10,000 places are ever going to happen. So it's drawn a line under those plans and started again on a completely new 10,000 target. So these are now completely new places unrelated to the previous plans. So what's the first prison to be built under these completely new plans? It's the new building at Full Sutton in Yorkshire, which was first announced in 2016. So there's some extra money and some extra places, but it's definitely not all new, as, as was announced. And we're having to deal with this sort of thing all the time. How about something a little trickier and maybe a bit more in your area? Jeremy Hunt said during the leadership election that if the UK was growing at 3% a year instead of 1.5% a year, then the government would have an extra £20 billion to spend. Now, the mechanism going from economic growth to the tax take is not entirely straightforward, but there are back-of-an-envelope calculations you can make to find out if it's reasonably likely to be true. The output of the economy is about £2.2 trillion a year. 1.5% of that is £33 billion. So Mr. Hunt was talking about an extra £33 billion of output, leading to an extra £20 billion in government revenue, which was particularly unlikely, given that the way he was going to spark this extra growth was with big cuts in corporation tax. But the point is that when we get to the more difficult claims like this, or people claiming that the UK has the highest train fares in Europe, or even when we were asked to work out whether you can reliably predict who will win Strictly Come Dancing at the halfway stage, that's when we need your help. Incidentally, on the Strictly question, the only reliable indicator is how many points a contestant has had in the first half of the series, which is fair enough. Also, the samba, the rumba, the cha-cha-cha and the jive get significantly lower points than the other dances, and if you get a 10 from Craig, you're almost certainly going to be in the last three. We wasted an extraordinary amount of Susan Connolly's time, she's a, another RSS uh, ambassador, on that one, and we wasted huge amounts of Deirdre Toha's time looking further into how likely you are to bump into a friend at a music festival. Is either of them here? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> thank you for letting us waste huge amounts of your time. <laughs> and actually, thank you to all of the RSS members who take time to help out journalists in need of explanations, sometimes in more important areas than strictly. The point is that you all have your specialist subjects. If you hear people making high-profile claims that you know are nonsense, then find a way to tell the world. Use social media, publish a blog, tag me in a tweet or drop me an email. If you're getting in touch with me, it's important to remember two of our key rules. People are entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts, and you can't reality check the future. So if somebody says that sovereignty is the most important thing in the world or GDP is going to grow 5% next year, we can add context and point out that other people, maybe even a majority of people, or mainstream economic opinion, disagrees. But we can't say they're wrong. Unlike when Dominic Raab said on the Today programme that he'd given many interviews on the BBC during the EU referendum campaign in which he'd said that he would prefer to have a deal but would leave with no deal if necessary. Over two days, we listened to every interview he gave on BBC National Services during that period and could only find one instance on which he'd accepted that no deal was even a possibility. You all have skills that are relatively unusual. Most people don't understand the stuff that you do. I hope that in the coming years, lots and lots of people will read my book and understand a bit more about it and be able to spot if they're being misled. But you're on the front line, and I really hope you'll take it upon yourselves to try to correct the record when dodgy claims are being made in public. And if anyone would like a signed copy of my book, then you'll find me in the ICC lobby selling them at Amazon prices shortly. <laughs> thank you for listening, and thank you to the Society for its continuing support of my work and for all of the journalists trying to understand statistics. So in one of the previous sessions on, I think it was Tuesday, 
and somebody was talking about the, the use of tissues, and they were talking about a particular red bus and a claim that was made on that bus. Um, and what he said was that by the time people who were fact-checking it had come up with an alternative figure that wasn't £350 million a week, the bus had already left and the political point had been made and all the people had gone home and voted. So I wondered whether you had any opinions on that. Yes, yeah, so there are a couple of things. First of all, the, the claim about £350 million a week was made long before it was put on the bus and Reality Check points out it was wrong long before the bus was painted. Um, but the other thing is there are two... There are two sort of big number problems with the 350 million on a bus. The first is that the actual number off he deducted the rebate was 276 million. And we're not very good at telling the difference between 350 million pounds a week and 276 million pounds a week. So every time we pointed out that actually it wasn't 350 million, it's 276 million, what people heard was, well, it's not this enormous pile of money, it's this enormous pile of money. So there was... I'm not sure how much help it did pointing out that it wasn't true. And the other thing was that the other big number problem with it was that £350 million sounds, again, like a lot, but if leaving the EU turned out to be either very good or, well, e either a little bit good or a little bit bad for the economy, that £350 million a week would be dwarfed by the difference that that would make to the government finances you know, even if it goes up by 1% or down by 1%. So 350 million pounds wasn't a big number, it sounded like a big number, and it was indistinguishable from the correct number. But we did notice it very early on. I'd like to know, how do you, because you must just see these fake numbers all the time, how do you decide which ones you're actually going to investigate and put on reality check, do you have some sort of hierarchy as to which are the most important issues that you think should be communicated? Yeah, I mean, if you look on the front page of the BBC website, you'll see that there aren't a lot of slots there, and there certainly aren't a lot of slots near the top. So the first thing is, is this a story that's, that's high up in the news agenda? Is it something that, that's important, something that, that people are going to read? Because while occasionally we do something that we think is important, but no one's going to read, it's not you know, a great use of, use of our time. So the first thing is what, just what's, um, what's high on the agenda. Um, and then after that, it's what we think, whether there's something we think we have something useful to say and whether the difference is, is important. So there were discussions uh, in a, I think, a Jeremy Corbyn speech the other day about whether the distance from Leeds to Manchester was more than the distance from one end of the central line to the other. <coughs> and, you know, we could have done it, but really, does anybody actually care? Does it make a great deal of difference to, <coughs> to what's going on? So we don't want to get the reputation of being, for being the, the team that just goes around pointing out things that, are, that, that might or might not be wrong that don't really matter. So it's relevance and, and how high profile it is are the main places we start. Uh, we've got a couple. I'm going to take the one right at the back first, and then we'll take the one a few further forward. Sorry, I'm making you uh, run. So. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much. I, I just wondered if you had any views on um, the situation. We do talk a lot about fake news now, and I wonder if it's just because there's more access to information, or actually there's been a change in the way that people present false information. I mean, for example, did Harold Wilson make lots of outrageous claims in the 1960s? Um, or, or did that sort of thing tend not to happen then? Yeah, I mean, fake news in the sense that it's generally meant, so people who are just, you know, making stuff up and posting it online, in that sense clearly is a, is a new thing because, you know, there's, there's online to do it with. But if we're talking about people using sort of unreliable numbers. I mean, I, I, you'll be surprised here, I wasn't working at the, the time of Harold Wilson. Um, I suppose, now, who was I talking to? I was talking to, our, uh, to the, uh, the new chair of the UK Statistics Authority, Sir David Norgrove, who was saying that, that when he worked at number 10 with Margaret Thatcher and then John Major, that they were kept 
they were sort of kept up all night making sure that figures that were going to be used were actually, were, were actually accurate and couldn't be challenged. And it's been suggested that later prime ministers haven't, haven't cared as much. Now, before the EU referendum, you would see, you know, people would use figures that might turn out not to be true, and you'd point them out, and you wouldn't hear the figure again. Um, and what was unusual about the EU referendum was that there were figures that we pointed out were wrong that were then used again the following day. And, and that's something that, that I found particularly unusual. And actually, it's, it's not something that I've seen happening in general election campaigns. There was something particular about the EU referendum. So there are bits of this that seem to be changing, and there are bits of it that are, you know, uh, politicians have, have always used spin and perhaps uh, not always cared as much as they should have done about their actions. And I believe there was another question just for you. Yeah. Could you say um, just something about how the top 10 stories or the top story on the BBC website is actually arrived at in terms of editorial judgment or numerics or whatever? Because that's actually quite important in um, pe what people take who go just go onto the website and look quickly about what's going on in the world and what they ought to be concerned about. It's not really my area. Um, I mean, th there is a... a front page team, there's a, a UK front page and a global facing front page team and they will look at what's on the agenda and decide what they think should be the, the top story of the day and uh, there are many, they take, it, they take the question very seriously and there are lots of discussions at very senior levels as to what we consider to be the top story of the day but I'm afraid that's, that's not really my, my area of expertise. Do we have any more questions? Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, I was wondering, we spend a lot of time on thinking what we do with graphs and how we make use of graphs to make statistics more understandable, better, clearer. Do you use graphs and any ideas on that? Uh, I do use graphs. Um, I'm something of a graphical purist. I tend to use a bar chart unless there's a very, very strong reason not to. Um, we have, uh, we're in the useful position that there's, there's an internal system called in-depth toolkit that allows you to do only quite simple charts, which means that if you want to do something sort of more complicated and a, a little tricky, then you've actually got to get a, get a designer to, to do it, which means that we don't end up with insane, curly, not in, not in BBC style charts all over the place, which would, uh, think put people off. Um, I, I'm no longer with the, the visual journalism team, but they have uh, an extremely talented bunch of, of designers there um, who I'm pleased to say are also quite, uh, quite graphical purists and, uh, you know, try getting a pie chart with more than three various bar variables past them and it's just not going to happen. Um, so again, it's something that, that a lot of thought goes into. Um, Many people feel that the colours that we use are a bit drab, but apparently that's due to hefty research into what colours the highest proportion of people can perceive. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, it's, it's all to do with, with accessibility. But yes, we, spend, we, do, we do use a lot of graphics, and, uh, and there are properly qualified people who think about them carefully as well as, as, as we do. What, what I maybe try to say more, do you think that graphs are more clear than text often, or? Well, if they're not, then you shouldn't be using them. <laughs> um, I, I used to do a, a, a course about data visualization, and I had this wonderful set of, of graphs taken from, mainly from national newspapers, which just weren't helping anything at all. Maps, maps do this the most. You see extraordinary amount of uses of, of, of maps in a story which just aren't helping anyone with anything where all it's showing you is where, you know, where Brazil is or something and people know where Brazil is and if they don't they can look elsewhere. It's not visualizing your data at all. Um, so yeah, I, I tend to be on the, uh, I, I tend to avoid charts when I can and uh, you see fewer, fewer of these really 
dodgy ones. There was one in the Times a little while ago about economic growth, and there was a big picture of a snail, and the, the snail's shell had sort of curl on it, and different points on the curl were supposed to denote the level of economic growth, depending on how far it was from the center. But then it had the headline, growth has been sluggish, and it wasn't a slug, it was a snail. <laughs> <laughs> and I was livid. <laughs> so, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Would you ever uh, reality check a graph? <laughs> I can't. I don't think we ever have. Um, there are sometimes, you know, people post something on Facebook sort of graphically, but it's, it's the facts that, are, that you're looking at rather than, rather than the way it's been posted. So I don't think we have. Uh, I hesitate to say we definitely haven't, but I can't remember one. Okay. Any other, yep. yep. I was given the microphone, so I have to speak. Uh, <laughs> um, last year, if I recall, the BBC was dinged by Ofcom for sort of false balance in, in its presentation of climate change issues. I for was wondering... What, for what, sorry? Um, for, um, I think, false balance in reporting okay. on climate change yep. issues. I was wondering if you have a perspective on that and on sort of what can be changed sort of following on from that. So what, the thing with climate change was that it was suggested that at times the BBC had uh, felt that when you're talking about climate change that you have someone along who does think that climate change is a real thing and someone along who doesn't think that climate change is a real thing and that's fine. And clearly that's uh, unreasonable, that, that's not a, a reasonable balance. Um, and that has changed considerably um, over the years. But the whole point of, of reality check was that it was felt that the, the ingrained uh, feeling for BBC journalists is that you find one person who thinks one thing and one third person who thinks the other, and then you let the audience decide. And that, that actually often that's not, that's not enough, and the audience needs more help. And the point of reality check was that we were then in a position to say, this is what this side says, this is what that side says, and on rare occasions, this side's right, but more often, this, uh, this is a majority view, this is mainstream economic uh, theory, so we could point the audience towards uh, which side in a particular argument was true. And that's, that's sort of at the heart of, of, of reality check, the idea that there is statistical truth and you're entitled to point it out. Um, this, I think since we started doing reality check in 2015, this has spread more around the BBC and there's a lot of work being done uh, outside my pay grade into the, the notion of, um, of genuine, of um, due impartiality is the, the term that's used. Due impartiality, which is uh, not balance, it's uh, considering what's going on and deciding what uh, what help the audience needs or not. Deirdre, and then we'll take one more, and I think we might have to end it there. Okay, so you've mentioned quite at length kind of bad examples, but who do you think, maybe even outside the BBC, is doing particularly good work? Um, well, there are... There are a lot of fact checkers doing uh, doing a great deal of work, and I'm, you know, I, our friends at, at Full Fact and Channel Four uh, Fact Check are doing some are doing some great work. Um, I like some of the stuff that the Guardian does with data. Um, the FT has employed a, an extraordinary data team, and I love a lot of the stuff that they do. Alan Smith, who's their head of data biz, is sort of the, the guru in the area. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of great stuff uh, going on around, and I I love the efforts that the ONS is going to in publishing stuff that's sort of supposed to to hit the agenda and and answering questions that they feel need to be need to be answered rather than just banging out whatever their monthly stats are each month. So a lot of that stuff's terrific. Okay, this might have to be our last question. Okay, well, that's great. Finally <laughs> got it. <laughs> okay, what happens is, is uh, I have a question for you. I've got a friend who is a green supporter and has been trying to get on question time with no reply whatsoever. Then he tries to um, 
no register under his dad's name. His dad was a diehard Tory supporter. So then his dad got a call and an email. He was selected to be on question time. I'm just wondering, um, is this anything intrinsic bias in the BBC uh, as a broadcasting or organization, or is it by random chance, like people who are really with radical views and get screened out? So how are people chosen to be on question time? Sorry? <laughs> so how are people chosen to be, appear on question I've time? I've got no idea. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry, but that, but you could give me your opinion on this, right? <laughs> Would I want I mean, to? Without actually um, anything relating to your employer, but what do you think about this? What, what do I think about who's on question time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think uh, sometimes you could see their audience's reaction. I think they were probably picked in sort of way to, to make the shows sort of interesting in the bed. That's what I think. I mean, I think what you can see in oh, the Oh, is the questions orchestra in some sort of ways? Okay. What you can see in the question time audience is people who are willing to give up their Thursday evening to go and ask questions of politicians. So I think if there's, if there's a bias there, it's people who are unrepresentatively interested in politics. But beyond that, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know how Question Time chooses its audience. Sorry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, OK, on that note, um, we may have to leave that there. But can we please thank Anthony Rubin again for a really, really interesting talk.